Welcome to chapel, guys. Before we start anything, can I have Dr. Wilbert come down here? So it's Dr. Wilbur's birthday today. So everybody, we're gonna sing happy birthday to him, all right? You ready? Happy birthday. So today, we'll have Mr. Smith speaking uh, on our series, Spitting Fire, that Paul and Ava left off on last week. He's going to be speaking about the power of our words. Um, and before we get into that, though, we'll have a time of worship. So can you please stand, uh, throw your arms around each other where you are, and then we'll pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for the opportunity you give us to be here in this building uh, with the ability to worship you. I pray for Mr. Smith that he's coming up. Uh, pray for a limit of distractions, that everyone will be attentive and listen and pay attention. And I pray that this worship will be authentic. And in your name I pray, amen.
Come on, give him a shout of praise today. Giants fall because he stands undefeated. Giants fall, anxiety falls, depression falls. Things that you're going through in your family falls because he stands on the throne today. He's risen and he's alive. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise today because he's worthy of our praise. He's so good to us. He's so good to us. Thank you, Lord. We praise you today. promises you've kept every need that you have made Lord I'm so grateful you were with me every step and I will not forget when I think of how you blessed me how your hand has never let me go never let me go so good to me and God I can't believe how you love me what a friend you have been so good to me and God I can't believe how you love me what a friend you have been he's our friend our friend every day and I call you Savior for the blood that washed me clean for the wrongs that you've redeemed and I know you're able my eyes don't one more reason to believe when I think of how you bless me, how you hand is never let me go, never let me go. We say you have been so good to me. God, I can't believe how you
friend, you're a friend, Jesus, not someone we don't know, our friend, our friend, we trust you, Jesus. God, we thank you that you are our friend. You aren't just someone who's big and powerful and up in the sky that we can't contain, but that you're our friend. We have a friend in you. Through any mistake that we make, through any mistakes that we have made, for whatever thoughts go through our brain, you are our friend. And we're so grateful for that. We thank you, God. We praise you a God that never leaves us, a God that always loves us, his love never fails. We put our full faith and our full trust in you today, God. Be with us today. We give you all the praise and all the glory. And in your name we pray, amen, amen. Well, you guys can go ahead and take your seats. back in this series called Spitting Fire, and it comes, if you haven't caught, from this passage in James 3, where James talks about the tongue being like a fire that sets a whole forest ablaze. And it's this idea that there's incredible power in the way that we talk. It has a power of life and death, of, of building up or destroying. And if we're going to learn to set the tone for people and what it looks like to follow Jesus, we have got to figure out how to deal with the way we talk to people and the way we talk about people. Last week, Paul and Ava uh, did a, just an incredible job of, of pointing us in the direction of the reality that our words are coming from and out of the overflow of our hearts. Our words are revealing what is in us. And if we begin to understand that our identity is in Christ, it will change the way we talk. Paul brought up this verse in Matthew, and I wanna, I wanna come back to it as we start into today. It's Matthew, and Jesus is addressing people, and he says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But Jesus didn't stop there. He actually continues and says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted or set free. By your words you will be condemned. We're gonna be judged by the words. Wait, 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 wait. I thought, I thought God judged the heart. Yeah, he does. What comes out of the heart is evidence. God knows your heart. Your words are how you know your heart. So we pay attention to the, the words that are revealing our hearts because we're going to be judged by that. There's other parts of Scripture that says the heart is deceitful. The scary thing is, is like it's deceiving us. So we can have this impression that like, hey, no, we're good, I'm good, I'm good, I've got a good heart. And yet, James is saying, wait, wait, pay attention to what you're saying, because it may be revealing something that you're not aware of, that your heart is deceiving you about. That's good. We need to learn to speak like Jesus. This is why James also tells us, be slow to speak and quick to listen. James is saying, uh, catch this guys, James is saying, the first step to speaking like Jesus is to stop speaking. We talk too much, just stop. 
We don't have enough self-control in the way we talk, so we just need to stop. We need to start listening more. Pay attention to what's being said. We've got to learn how to read the room before we speak in the room. That's what James is challenging us with. I don't know if if, uh, you have seen this happen. I'm sure you have, because I've seen it like 100 times, and it makes me cringe every time I see it. You ever seen like a guy who has a crush on a girl? And, and he's trying to impress her, so he's just like talking and talking, and, and she's just not interested. Oh, that's a rough spot to be. And, and like everyone in the room knows it, ex- apparently except for him, because he just keeps going in, trying to crack jokes, trying to be funny, going on and on about something he's an expert in, and the girl's just like could care less. I've seen it this way, like you might see it in a room, I've seen it in text messages, where people are like, look, you're showing me this, and it's like a book. Right, like just like text after text after text, and all the girl's doing is like, thumbs up, like cool, neat, and just like, you're just sitting there like, my dude, stop. Like read the room, she is just not into you, move on. Wow, wow. Ooh, that's rough. No, no, let's say it this way. Have you ever been at a friend's house, right? And at your friend's house, your friend's get, he's gotten into trouble or she's gotten into trouble um, and she's arguing with her parents and you can see they're just getting, the more they argue, the angrier the parents are getting and you're like, please, for the love of God, stop. Like you are making this awkward for me and for your parents and for you. You're just digging yourself into a bigger, bigger hole. Will you just read the room with what your parents are reacting to and just stop? And, and listen and pay attention to what's happening. Or, or we'll go this way with it. I used to play, I played basketball in high school. And, and I would watch uh, the guys, uh, not so much on my team, but like on occasion, but guys would like, they, they would, the, the ref would make a call and they wouldn't agree with it. And so they would just like start getting petty about it and start going off on the ref like over and over again. And you would watch the ref just like, bro, you are not changing that call. Right. Now, every time you touch the ball, that, that dude's gonna be ready with that whistle every single time, right? So what I did, I was, before the game, I was like dapping up the, the ref, like joking with him, making, like, like making friends, because like I needed that man on my side, yeah. right? I read the room and I saw what other people were doing, and I was like, that's not working for them. I need something different because like we need this ref dude to help us out. Yeah. Read the room, made adjustments. This is what it looks like. And, and, and a lot of times, here's what I would say, like there's verbal and nonverbal, and I say verbal and nonverbal because a lot of what's being said isn't necessarily out loud. I read something that experts agree that communication is around 70 to 90% nonverbal. That only seven to 10% of what you communicate is actually the words you use. That about 35% of that is the tone in which you say it in. And 55% of that is your body language. How, How you're posted up, people are reading that. We're saying a lot without saying anything at all. So James is saying to set the tone of what it looks like to speak like Jesus first, just stop talking and listen. Learn to read the room. But, but the question is, what are we listening for? What, what are we looking for? Well, if you're gonna speak like Jesus speaks, you gotta learn to see how Jesus sees. If, if what we say is coming from our hearts, then our hearts need to be moved in the same way that Jesus' heart was moved. This isn't a mystery to figure out either. The gospel writers make this incredibly clear to us on how Jesus saw people, and as a result, how he responded to them. Jesus spent his whole ministry on earth talking with people. There's this, this, uh, you have people like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is this Jewish tax collector um, who was hated by the Jewish people because he was making bank off of exploiting them. The, the Roman governors would require a specific tax on Jewish people, and then they would hire people to go out and collect that tax. But there's no IRS, there's no like validating what the tax was. So these tax collectors would go and collect more than the Roman government required, and then just pocket the extra. Right. Now that's fine if you're a Roman citizen doing that to Jewish people, that's expected. Your nation is oppressing ours. Right. But when you're a Jew and you're doing that to your own people, right. you gotta watch your back when you go in the streets. And so you have this moment, and Jesus is walking to Jericho, is what it says. And he said, that's Jericho's like where the walls fell down from the city because of the presence of God moving forward in it. And there's this crowd walking with him, and there's no sound system. There's no speakers and mics, and so people are like pressing in, pushing in to, to be close 
to Jesus so that they can see him or hear him speak and watch him heal. And Zacchaeus is around and he's not willing to risk his life by getting into the crowd because this crowd is, is gonna hate him. But wanting to see for himself and hear for himself what Jesus is like, he goes and climbs a tree to watch from kind of a safe distance. And Jesus spots this man. In a sea of people who are pushing to get something from Jesus, Jesus locks eyes on the man who's trying to hide something. This is the kind of person that Jesus looks for. Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and says, come down from there. And I imagine that's not just come down from that tree. Bro, come down from what you're doing. I'm, I'm coming over to your house. I wanna know you. I'm fascinated by you. He chose to go deeper. He sees the odd one out and invites them in. That's how Jesus sees people. There's this other story uh, in Luke where Luke tells about this time where Jesus is at the house of a Pharisee eating dinner and this woman comes in with this expensive jar of perfume and, and I wanna read this together here. And he says, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume over them. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him right now. What kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner, and Jesus is picking up on this because he's reading the room. Now it's not clear if Jesus actually heard the man say this or not, or whether by like divine nature he just knew what the dude was saying, or if he's just reading the guy's face and just picking up on like the judgmental attitude. Regardless, Jesus is, is reading the room and he says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Now I wanna pause for a second because I want you guys to catch what just happened here. If you'll notice the way Luke presents this, he goes, it's one of the Pharisees invited Jesus. He's not even calling the dude by name. He went to that Pharisee's house. He was eating at the Pharisee's house. It was the Pharisee who had invited him in. And then Jesus says, Simon. Luke is picking up on this dude is just a judgmental, condescending jerk. That's all he is. And Jesus is saying, Simon, I see you, and I've got something for you. This is how Jesus sees people. So Simon says, tell me, teacher, what you got for me? And so he says, he tells this story. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other one 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both, one large, one small. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Jesus said, you've judged correctly. Then he turns to the woman and says to Simon, Simon, do you see this woman? Time out. We're gonna go back to verse 39. Because Luke just did something here that we've gotta pick up on. Verse 39, what Luke tells us, when the Pharisee saw this, when the Pharisee saw this, meaning the actions and behavior of this woman, the reputation of this woman, the seemingly ignorance of Jesus, because he's saying if he was really a prophet, he would know who it is. Yeah. Also, if he's a holy man, he wouldn't let her do that. Wow. So like he's seeing the actions and Jesus says, do you see the woman? Yeah. His actions led him, the, the actions that he saw, the things he was looking for, led him to just stay in this place of judgment and arrogance. And Jesus is looking at the heart and he goes, let me tell you, Simon, what I see. And th this is where he goes through. I came into your house and you didn't give me any water, but she wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume, perfume on my feet. 
Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as great as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. He, he sees you, you came in with this judgmental, arrogant attitude and you missed the whole thing. You know what's crazy about this? Who is Jesus correcting? They're both in sin. Yeah, wow. This is a woman that has a lifestyle of sin. He forgives her and corrects the, <laughs> the attitude of this dude who's jumping to conclusions and assumptions and missed the whole thing. Now the question is, who did Jesus love in this moment? It's both. Reading the room, he responds to each of them with what was needed. He loved the woman by extending grace because he sees her heart is already repenting. Simon missed that. She's coming to him in humility, in tears, in recognition of who he is, and he knows she's ready to receive grace and extends it to her. He corrects Simon because he loves Simon. The loving thing to do was to correct the judgmental attitude because it was keeping him from seeing who that woman really was and who Jesus really is. And the fruit of that judgmental heart that Simon had was destructive words, which is revealing a heart that's far from God, and Jesus loved him too much to leave him there. And so he calls him out of that. Jesus saw people first, but he's not just seeing people. He saw people in debt to him, which is why he tells the story of two people who, are, who have a debt with a, with a person. He sees people in debt to him, and rather than rising up against them, he lowers himself in humility, and meets them where they're, at, where they're at, not begrudgingly, but out of joy. The author of Hebrews, in, in Hebrews 12, 2, says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. When Jesus saw each of the people he interacted with, it was joy that moved him into an interaction with that. Each person must have been a confirmation of the work that he was committing to, the work of the cross that he knew he was going to have to suffer through, and he knew it was worth it. Jesus sees each of us as a reward for a sacrifice. We are undeserving of that kind of sacrifice, but Jesus deems us worth it. Undeserving, but but worth it. And when we see each other, if we're gonna see like Jesus saw, we must see them as worthy of the sacrifice that Christ made because that's how Jesus saw them. Jesus knew why he was on earth. He knew his purpose was leading him to the cross, so he would have seen each person through that lens, through the lens of the cross. Every person he interacted with would have been a reminder of the suffering that he was gonna go through. And his response to that was joy. It's worth it. Now, we love to hear that idea when we think about ourselves. We love to hear that idea when we talk about our identity in Christ. But here's the problem, we stop there. Family, this is out of joy, but, or out of love, but hear me on this. You are not the only one Jesus sees that way. Wow. Wow. That same joy he has for you, he has that same joy for the person you hate. That same love he has and he finds in you, he has that same love for the person that you tear down behind their back. That same willingness to suffer, to provide you freedom, he willingly suffered for the person that you are causing to suffer. And even in the midst of that, Jesus is patient and gracious with us. Praise God. I want you to think of someone that you love more than anyone else. Who's someone you love just dear, close to your your heart in this world? For me, it's my family. My my wife and my son, that's, that's like, whew, that's everything. Now, what's your response when you, if you hear somebody just like bad mouthing them? Here's my response. In the words of the great philosopher, Toby Nwigwe. Thank you, somebody caught that back there. Appreciate that. 
Try Jesus, don't try me, because I throw hands. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Lovingly. Lovingly. Go to Jesus. Don't go to me, because I don't have the same patience Jesus has. Praise God for his patience with us. Guys, listen, even in his suffering, while he's dying for the, for the people that are killing him and mocking him in the process, he didn't throw hands at us. He threw them wide open. Yeah. Saying, Father, I see them. Forgive them. They, don't, they have no clue what they're doing. And guys, Jesus is inviting us to do the same thing with each other to see each other the way he sees us, worth the sacrifice, and if they're worth the love of Jesus, they are worth our love as well. Yes. Do you know how different this world would be if we saw people the way Jesus sees us? Yeah. You wouldn't see people as a threat, you'd see them as a blessing in your life. Yeah. And when you, when you treat people as a threat, you put your guard up, you put walls up, we sang the song this morning in worship, Champion, and it says, when I open my, my mouth, walls come crashing down. Yeah. And while we're singing this, I'm, I'm reminded of this, this moment where Jesus is on his way to Jericho. The city, the place where walls fell down because of the presence of God. And on his way to that place, he sees Zacchaeus, who was outside of a community because of walls he built, but because of walls that the community was reinforcing. Yeah. And Jesus opened his mouth and walls came crashing down. Yeah. And Zacchaeus didn't just accept forgiveness from God for what he did, he went and sold everything and paid back people more than what he stole from them. Yeah. So that restoration wasn't just between Zacchaeus and Jesus and Zacchaeus and God, it was Zacchaeus and the whole community. Yeah. The walls started coming down because Jesus opened his mouth. And that wouldn't have happened if people just kept reinforcing those walls with bitterness and hatred with what, he, what Zacchaeus had done. It wasn't until Jesus saw him as a person who needed to experience the love of God that those walls came down. That's, good. That's what our words should be doing for each other. If we're gonna imitate Christ, that's what our words will do. When we see each other, including the people that you hate, including the people that you don't understand, including the people that just annoy you to no end, the walls you have put up between you and them and the walls they have up will come down as you invite them in. Yeah, this is good, this is good. And when those walls come down, you're gonna find freedom, you're gonna find lives that change. But guys, when we don't get this right, we do not have a problem with our speech we have a problem with our vision. We are not seeing people the way God sees them. Because when you do, it's gonna change the way you talk to them. That's right. Now before you go into those moments, before you ever get to a place where you're, you're tempted to, to rip someone apart, to tear them down to their face or behind their back or, or whatever, Begin to ask God before you ever get there. God, search my heart. Re reveal in me anything that is not like you. God, bring that to the surface so that we can deal with this, so that I can, I can see people the way you see them. And God, help me see people like you see them. Now, I wanna, I wanna share just one more kind of piece, because. I know that we are in a community of people who are supposed to be imitating Christ. And we fail and mess up at this. And I wanna remind you of what I said at the very first chapel of the year with our year verse. The gospel, what Christ is calling us into, that is a beautiful tune that, that gives life to us. But we don't always play that well. And if you have been wounded and torn down and torn apart by people who call themselves followers of Christ, don't put that on Christ. Yeah. We got some people who just are really bad at playing the gospel. And if you're in that place of, of playing the gospel really, really poorly with people, 
Man, will you ask God to give you eyes that see people like he sees us? Because when we have our identity solidly placed in Christ, and when we start to see people the way he sees us, it changes everything in the way we talk to them. Let me pray for us. Father, you are so patient with us and gracious with us. God, we are Simon. God, we are the the person who, even while inviting you into our place, look at each other and cast judgment and condemnation and bitterness because we don't see people the way you see them. So God, will you change that in us? God, would we first look to see people as worthy of the sacrifice you made and the love that you have? God, may we not accept that just for ourselves, your love for us, but but may that be the overflow of our heart from which we speak. God, we love you, and we need your spirit to change this in us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, We have some reflection questions for you from that. Um, The first one is, who do you need to see differently in your life? Um, This could also be said, like, Who have you been judgmental towards? Um, Who have you destroyed with the way you talk to them or about them? And another way you can phrase it is, who is someone you have already gave an identity to the point where you don't see that person as anything but that identity? Jesus didn't see Zacchaeus and the woman who washes Jesus' feet with perfume as anything but people who are in need of the cross. Why can't we do that? Second question says, where do you need to open your mouth for walls to come down? Who do you need to invite in? Who do you need to speak life into? Or who do you think needs encouraged? I'm just gonna give you guys a minute, reflect on those. All right, so for me personally, the second question hits me. Um, and, well, they both tie into each other greatly. Uh, so I get comfortable in my routine talking to the same friends, hanging out with the same friends, and not speaking life or encouraging other people who are not yet my friends or just acquaintances. So going forward, I personally am going to try to get out of my comfort zone and try and break that routine so that I can invite others in and speak life or encourage them, which will not only help their growth, but it'll also help mine um, because it causes me to be more bold. So I challenge everyone to be bold. Apply this to your life. Get out of your comfort zone. Ask God to help you see people like he sees us so that you can apply this. On that note, thank you. You're all dismissed.